Oh, hi, everyone. So hi, I'm joining you from the beautiful Upper Peninsula. We've migrated and traveled all over in our quest and our journey for the life of the Straits. And today I am in the Lachineau area, which is just above the Mackinac Bridge. So the Lachineau area, um, it comes from the French term for the channels. Um, this is a 36 island archipelago that spans 12 miles of Lake Huron shoreline. And it is absolutely Absolutely gorgeous. Historically, this area has been nav navigated by the Native Americans and French explorers as they travel to and from the Straits of Mackinac to the St. Mary's River. And this area also includes the Cedarville and Hessel area. So thank you for joining me on my glorious hike. And now I'm going to turn it over to Elliot. Thanks, Susan, for that intro. This is much appreciated. The Lachino Islands is a very special place to me. It is the area that I grew up in as a kid, and it means a lot to me. If you're not familiar with where the islands are, well, here's our Great Lakes map. And as we look, it's right in the Straits. So we'll zoom into the Straits of Mackinac as a quick refresher. This is all the watersheds of the Straits of Mackinac. All the water that falls within this area inside the blue area ends up in the Straits. And the Straits is really that area right between Mackinac City and St. Ignace, it's that narrow channel. Now the Lachineau Islands are up in that area, right up there in the top. So let's take a little bit of a closer look. And we're gonna do a little quiz today, a little polling to see what you might know or what you might have just heard from Susan. So we'll see how well you were listening and um, start a few poll questions off. So the first question is, how many islands are there in the Lachino Islands? It's a chain or an archipelago, which is a, basically a group of islands. Other archipelagos include places like the Hawaiian Islands. Um, but of course, Susan just told you. And so I think we're seeing that 100% of the people answered correctly. It's 36 islands in the Lachino area. Well done. All right. Now, here's a little bit of a trickier question. Out of all these islands, many of them are owned privately, meaning they're private land with cabins. Um, they've actually been, uh, as Susan mentioned, they were were populated by Native Americans for thousands of years and it was a major trade area, um, lots of fur trapping and fishing. Um, but there was also eventually over time a large European tourist in industry and there were many hotels on these islands and so a lot of them are private but there are a few publicly owned islands and see if by the names of these islands you can guess which one is a public island. These are all islands of the Lachino, Boot Island, Coriel Island, Government Island, Marquette Island, and Alligator Island. Which of those islands do you think is owned uh, by the public, like a national forest or a state forest? We'll give it a couple more seconds for questions or for people to give a guess. And everyone got it right it's government island that's right the government island is owned by the government which means it's owned by us all the taxpayers of the government and it is owned run managed by the usda forest service it's uh right in the middle of the lational islands right in the heart next to coriel island uh, island number eight doesn't show up super well on this map but uh it, it is a great little island that you can go camping on okay We've got some more poll questions for you here. We'll keep the polls running and going as we keep covering this uh, beautiful area. So the next question, well, before we get to the next question, um, I want you to just get a feel for these islands. They're, they're a great place to come vacation all times of the seasons, but they also have a vibrant um, set of full round, full year round residents, both on the islands and on the mainland next to the islands. Um, so I'm gonna share this little clip for you here. Discover a place where land and water intertwine, where countless paths and waterways are waiting to be explored, and where one's true self can be found. East of the Mackinac Bridge, 36 islands span across 12 miles of Lake Huron's northern shore, offering shelter and creating a recreational paradise. It's a place where every season provides vibrant new activities, culture, and art to experience. And every turn leads to a stunning waterfront vista. 
where the classic harbor towns of Hessel and Cedarville carry rich histories and craft that can be seen in the dining, shopping, and entertainment they offer. Breathe in the fresh air and experience a place whose beauty runs as deep as the fresh water that surrounds it. Discover Le Cheneau, Michigan's land of water. Hope you enjoyed that little bit of flavor of the islands there and the Le Cheneau region. The mainland towns of Cedarville and Hassel are really great. Now let's get another poll question going here. I wanna know um, how many people remember what does Le Cheneau mean? It is, has some French origins, but the spelling is kind of weird. It might have some English or some Ojibwe or Anishinaabe uh, influence to the spelling. There's some debate, but it has a particular meaning. So let's get a few more answers in and see what people think. All right. And so 100% of the people remembered what Susan said. It's known, uh, called the Leishno because that means the channels. And there are many channels throughout the Leishno's here. You can see all those different bays and little inlets and outlets. And that creates a lot of different types of ecosystems. So we're gonna learn a little bit about not so much the people today, but the animals, plants, and ecosystems of the Leishno Islands. So all those channels house many different types of fish. And fish really rely on places like wetlands and shallow areas and right near the shoreline to lay their eggs and for their young to survive those nice protected areas before they go out to the big waters. So um, maybe you've gone fishing in the Le Chineaux. In fact, if you've gone to the Le Chineaux, put it in the chat or in the Q&A and let us know. I'd love to know who's actually explored here. Uh, but if you haven't, um, you still may have caught this type of fish species before. And so let me, oops. Let me ask this next poll question. What type of fish is this? All right, so this fish has a really good fight to it. A lot of people like to fish for these. They're normally near shore areas. They like to hide under logs, um, sometimes in weedy areas. Let's do a few more seconds to take any poll answers here. Is it a bass, a perch, a pike, a lake herring, also known as a cisco, or a trout? Ooh, answers are a little split on this one. Well, folks, the answer is a smallmouth bass. Now, the Lation Islands is actually one of the best places around to go smallmouth bass fishing. It's not really known for that, but the smallmouth bass population has really grown over the last years, and it has excellent bass fishing. All right, let's try another one. Uh, so what is this fish? Now this one's a little less well known. There's a really unique fishery here for this fish, which comes in from the big water to eat mayflies in June and July when they hatch and turn from aquatic organisms into flying organisms. Mayflies cover the whole area in the um, summer months in June and July. They come on to shore and they land in all the buildings, but they don't do anything bad. They have mouths. Um, or I'm sorry, they don't even have mouths, a lot of the species, because they only spend a few weeks as a flying land creature before they lay eggs, which will then become aquatic macroinvertebrates for a number of years. All right, we've got a few answers in, and this one's a tricky one. This is the lake herring, the lake herring or cisco. It is a really tasty fish when it's smoked. It's one of my, it's my favorite smoked fish actually. And if you're lucky enough to come up here, it's a really unique fishery that a few of our charter captains know how to take people out on. So you can learn to fish a whole new type of fish. It's really fun. Okay, last bit. These are all the wetlands of the Lake Snow on the land. So obviously the water is wet, but the land is very wet here too. And wetlands are one of the most important ecosystems in the world. They are biodiversity hotspots and they're where lots of different creatures spend their younger days. Lots of different types of bugs live in wetlands before they become a flying organism. And so they're really important. They're also really important for the little birds like this one. Um, when they come to shore uh, after migrating, and these are migration routes, they fly hundreds if not thousands of miles every year. And when they land on the shorelines after crossing the Great Lakes, there are a whole bunch of bugs waiting for them because they hatched out of the wetlands and out of the rocky shoreline at the same time that they're migrating through. It's crazy, it's amazing phenology. All right, so question here, what um, type of bird is this? Now this is a tough one. 
Uh, and it's either a black-throated blue warbler, a yellow-bellied sapsucker, a common tern, a black-crowned night heron, or a long-tailed duck. Now this is a species that comes from South America and spends its summers in the Les Chinos and in many places in northern part of the U.S. and Canada. All right, we're going to end the polling, and we've got a correct answer there. I see we've got a black-throated blue warbler. That's the correct answer on this one. It's a beautiful little bird that many people might miss, but it flies around all over the place in the spring and the summer. Awesome species. All right, and one last one. This is one that lives on the islands, a few islands. It's actually not common this far north, um, but this species is actually as a breeding colony on Crow Island. Go figure, right? Uh, crow Island has this species, which is not a, a crow. <laughs> um, so here's your choices again. And we'll give it a few seconds to get your best answer. A night heron, a duck, a tern, a sapsucker, or a warbler. Birds have funny names, don't they? All right, and we've got a correct answer again. I see a few answers, and black crowned night heron, though, is the correct answer. So. Great job, folks, on guessing some of these different birds and uh, uh, fish of the Lake Snow Island area. So this last one here is a common tern, and this is another species that nests on the islands, particularly on rocky shoals. Uh, it's a state-threatened species. So just emphasizing that there are a lot of really amazing um, little creatures that live throughout the Lake Snows in a variety of types of ecosystems. Now today, we're, I'm gonna take you on a journey to some really great uh, ecosystems that are found in a particularly special place within the Lake Snows. Now this isn't actually on an island, but it's right on the mainland. It looks across at, actually out to Bear and Crow Islands, a few of the um, most Eastern Lake Snow Islands. And this special place uh, means a lot to me. I grew up um, just within a few miles of this place. I was very lucky uh, to be able to grow up so, so close to such a wonderful place. So I'm going to share this place with you, and I hope you enjoy it as you watch this video. Welcome to the Wollum Nature Preserve a property owned by the Nature Conservancy, one of several land conservancies we have here in the Lake Chenault Island areas. We're gonna explore the preserve today, learning a little bit about the different ecosystems and habitats that exist here at the John Arthur Woolen Preserve. When we enter the preserve, there's a quick note to help stop the spread of invasive species. Invasive species are plants or animals that come from another location and were brought by humans on accident or sometimes on purpose. It's important to stop these invasive species before they take hold as invasive species tend to not have any predators and start to reproduce unchecked. They can crowd out native species and really disrupt a local ecosystem. So it's important to do things like use the boot brush. Here there's a simple brush that I can scrape the sides and bottom of my foot with to make sure that no seeds that I brought in will make it and get dropped off on the trail as I go on a hike. Always do your part to help stop the spread of invasive species. Now it's time to hit the trail. The Lachino Islands and the many preserves that are within them are right at the very southern edge of a very massive ecosystem known as the Boreal Forest. Now we're right kind of getting into that transition zone where we leave the hardwoods of the lower peninsula of Michigan and start to transition to boreal forest. Now the boreal forest goes all the way around the globe. You can find the same kind of forest in places like Japan and Russia and Northern Europe. And many of the species can be found in some of those other forests too. We'll check some of those out later today. Right here today, what we've got though is a really beautiful patch of thimbleberry. Now this thimbleberry is a very particular species that has a really big raspberry-like berry. Now these ones aren't quite ripe yet. They'll be bright red just like a raspberry when they're ripe. And you can see they're a little bit wider than a normal raspberry. They actually fit on your finger just like a thimble would. 
The thimbleberry makes a wonderful jam and great pies too, but it takes a lot of work to get enough to make any. There's only a few companies that will sell thimbleberry jam, like American Spoon, and it is pricey because it takes a lot of work to go through all of these different plants to get enough berries. Time to hit the trail again. Now that sound you hear is the rustling of the quaking aspen. Now like we said, this is boreal forest, but the boreal forest is made up of a variety of specific subsets of ecosystems. When a forest is cleared or a patch of land maybe has a tornado go through or logging happen, new plants start to arrive first that like a lot of sun and one of those plants is the quaking aspen now the quaking aspen right here is a plant with really unique little leaves that tremble in the wind you can hear them trembling now now what's interesting about the quaking aspen is that it doesn't live very long as far as trees go. About 50 to 80 years at most. We think of trees as living hundreds of years, but the quaking aspen lives just about as long as a person, sometimes not even as long as that. That's because as the quaking aspen grow up, they start to shade the understory, and we can see that it's quite shaded down here. Now, when there's lots of shade, baby quaking aspens cannot do as well. Instead, other plants, like this spruce plant here, the spruce tree, or this balsam fir here that has the needles, start to take over because they can grow in the shade. So we can see down here, there's almost no quaking aspen. But if we look up, we see those trembling leaves. This is called succession. As the forest ages, it begins to change the types of trees and species that grow there. It's all part of the natural way that ecosystems evolve and change over time. Here's another interesting set of plants that may look a little unassuming, but are quite amazing. Now this plant is called a bunchberry. You can see it has four leaves here, or some of them have up to six leaves, nice and around with thick veins, and of course a bunch of berries at the top. These are kind of whitish greenish now, but they will turn red eventually. Now what's amazing is that you can see this bunchberry growing all across the forest floor here, and this is an army of bunchberry clones. That's right, these plants are clones. They often spread by growing new roots out of an existing plant and popping up a genetically identical second plant and third plant and fourth plant until the bunchberry clones carpet the entire forest. Okay, maybe not the entire forest, but you can see they grow in pretty wide colonies. And it's a really neat system for being able to spread quickly. However, they do, do still make berries, which eventually make seeds which is another way that they can propagate. And one of the fascinating things about these flowers, when they first come out, this bunch of berries will actually be a white flower and it will have pollen and seeds that need to get the pollen to start to make the fruit. Now, the way that these plants spread their pollen is incredible. They are actually one of the fastest living things on the planet. That's right, a plant is one of the fastest things that we've ever recorded. Now, the way that it's fast is by releasing its pollen. It actually keeps the little pollen holder uh, called the stamen in a tiny little package that's spring-loaded. And when it's ready to release that pollen, that spring-loaded stamen pops out at 24,000 meters per second. It takes less than a millisecond, half of a millisecond, 
for that to happen. But it happens so fast that it is actually two to three thousand times the force of gravity. It's one of the fastest plant actions we've ever found. My camera could never record it because it takes a camera that can catch up to 10,000 frames per second just to get an even glimpse at this incredible pollen process. So the boreal forest might be full of some really cool plants and animals that are nice and big, but sometimes it's these little guys that have some of the most impressive and amazing features of all. Let's continue on our way. Well, we've now made it to the shoreline. And one of the hallmarks of the Lachino Island shorelines is that they're very rocky. We'll get to some other really unique rocky areas in a little bit, but these rocky shorelines are really important habitat. Shoreline is where the land meets the water. And in the Great Lakes, we have a lot of shoreline. And in the Straits area, we have a lot, a lot of shoreline. And that's because of all the islands and how jagged and bumpy our sh shorelines are. They're not straight, long, smooth shorelines most of the time. We have lots of little bays like here where the land goes in and out creating additional shoreline. Now this shoreline habitat houses a wide variety of species. Oh look, I think actually I see one of those really unique species over there. It's a mink. Look at him. He's scurrying around in the woods there. But he's right next to the shoreline. I wonder if he's going to go in the water. Minks are semi-aquatic. It means they live on both land and water, normally right around the shoreline. They feed on things like crayfish and small fish in the water. Oh, there he is. Oh, awesome little guy. They feed on things in the water, but they also eat birds and eggs. They've got a really oily fur from an oily gland that they produce that keeps them waterproof. Humans have been using that oil to waterproof leather and make special substances for a long time. Oh, there he goes. He's got webbed feet to help him swim. Well, that was a neat little adventure with the mink there. There's lots of mammals like the mink and otter that rely on these shoreline areas because inside these rocks that are in the water or underneath the rocks, I should say, and on them grow a lot of different types of organisms. Macro invertebrates and algae grow there. Things like crayfish, leeches. These are all really important food for things like um, the otter or the mink, but even more so is all the fish that grow and eat all those other macro invertebrates and provide food for the otter and the mink and things like blue herons or common terns. So most of the fish species we have in the Great Lakes rely on shorelines for at some point of their life cycle. A lot of them, when they're really small, live right into the shoreline. Maybe let's dive in here into the water a little bit and see if we can see any of those fish right now. Although we think of underwater as pretty empty, there's actually a lot of stuff going around. All these little dots you see flying around right now are pieces of debris or actual little critters, like plankton and zooplankton and macro invertebrates. Bugs that spend a lot of their life underwater before they hatch come on land. Oh, there's a small bass. This is a juvenile bass. Oh, really neat. A lot of fish spend their younger days in these shallow parts of the, near the shoreline. Time to head on the trail to the last part of our journey, getting us to one of the most fabled and amazing places in the Lachino Islands. Here we're coming up to the unofficial entrance to one of the most magical and mysterious places in the Lachino Islands. It's dominated by massively large boulders. This one is probably 15 feet tall and 30 feet wide, and this one's split in half. Let's walk through this together. Now you can see there's a sense of awe and mystery as you go between the giant split rocks, almost like we're going through a wardrobe together. Some might even call it 
the wardrobe. And when you get through the wardrobe in Narnia, you're of course gonna find the lamppost. Now, the lampposts, of course, was put here by people, but these rocks were brought here over 10,000 years ago by the last ice age. Massive giant glaciers tore up the bedrock around here and lifted up these large, huge boulders. Now you can see there's a lot of pitted edges and jaggedness to these, and that's because these boulders are made out of dolomite, which is calcium magnesium carbonate, but it's really a product of a million years ago, millions of years ago, when there was a sea here, an ocean. And this shallow ocean had a lot of shelled critters and creatures and corals that over thousands of years or maybe millions of years built up layers of dead shells that compressed and fossilized and became a sedimentary rock. Now this sedimentary rock in some places has actual fossils that you can still see today. Little bits of shell or coral, like here for example, we have a nice little line of coral that's still visible and running through here. It doesn't look like much, just a line, but it's evidence of the amazing uh, variation that used to be here. Now today, these rocks are really what I like to call a living rock. They are built up with hundreds if not thousands of years of plants that have started to create a little living system. Now these systems create are created by lichen that first form a little plant that is actually both a fungus and a photosynthetic algae. As they begin to grow they allow for a space for moss to start to take root on the rock. The moss builds up over time holding a lot of moisture on the rock which eventually starts to allow for a soil buildup and things like ferns to grow. There are different types of ferns across all of this rock. As that soil layer builds up more and more, as the ferns and moss begin to die and needles from nearby trees fall on there, we start to see other plants like this Canada Mayflower, a really nice pretty little plant. Eventually trees like this balsam fir or this cedar tree build up beginning to really form an entire ecosystem through their root systems. Really big. Amazing. Well, I hope you enjoyed exploring Narnia with me today. We've got more fun things to learn about the Lachianos. 
and I hope at some point you get to come here and learn for yourself in person. Exploring places like Narnia or Government Island are absolutely fantastic and worth every second that you spend here. Well, folks, thank you for coming along that journey with us today to explore a really neat place nestled within the Lachino Islands. Uh, it's just a little bit east of Cedarville. If you ever get here, go check out the Woolen Preserve and the property of Narnia, which actually is owned by the Carmoose Limestone Corporation that owns a quarry there. Um, but they have a recreation easement to allow people to go explore that rocky part in particular, which is right next to the Woolen Preserve. Well, now I'm going to hand it over to my friend Kaylee to share our challenge for the week, um, our little activity challenge. So take it away, Kaylee. Thanking you, Elliot, for sharing the Lachino Islands with us tonight. They are so beautiful. And I cannot wait to get um, up to Narnia and check it out for myself. So one of the things that Elliot talked about tonight with us that I would like to talk with you a little bit more about is the ecosystem. So the ecosystem, or one of the ecosystems that Elliot talked about was the boreal forest. So the boreal forest is actually a large ecosystem. And so that would be considered a biome. A small ecosystem, a micro ecosystem, would be something as small as the living things on the bark of a tree. Or I have another micro ecosystem to share with you tonight. And this is a pop bottle ecosystem that I've made. And this is the challenge that we're going to ask all of you this week. So as we do every week, we challenge you to make something, an activity or do something that will be a little carryover from the program that we provided you tonight. So on this ecosystem, I took a little trip to my pond today with a net, and a bowl, and I got some living things, and I got some non-living things, and so I put them all together in this ecosystem so I can explore on a smaller scale exactly what's going on in my pond. So I want to share with you a couple of things that are in here first. If we can see, I have a very cool green water bug in here, and there's a snail. Oh, there's the water bug. just incredible and has been so interesting to watch. So that's one of the really cool things about doing a micro ecosystem for you to explore on your own is being able to see all these things and really watch them on a closer level and a closer scale. So I'm going to show you how to make the pop bottle ecosystem yourself. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a two liter bottle and you're going to cut it just about where the lines begin to straighten on the bottle. You're going to eventually, you're going to turn that upside down. The second thing you're going to do is add some gravel, whether it's from the pond or the stream or the lake or wherever it is that you're gathering your things for your ecosystem. And then you're going to add whatever living things live there. Now, if you don't have access to a pond or a field stream or, or, or a freshwater stream or something, you could actually go buy goldfish and saw plant from your local greenhouse. And you could do this project that way as well. But I chose some snails and some water bugs and some water that's directly from that pond. So step three, you can see here what I've done. I took the top of the pop bottle and I have the cap on it. And just as we're going to have an adult cut the bottle, we're going to have an adult pop the hole in the bottom of that pop bottle cap. And then we're going to thread a piece of string through it. That string is going to allow for water to whip up into the soil of the pop bottle. So I hope you can see that well. The next thing that you're going to do, the next step is going to be adding soil to that inverted piece that you're going to turn upside down. And you're going to add some small plants from the biome that you've chosen. So here I chose some plants from around the edge of my pond that are not necessarily living in the water, but just on the outside of the water. So then step five, you're gonna put it all together like I've done. And when you've got it all together, because of course those plants are going to need sunlight, you have sunlight, you have air, you can see where we have the air, you have plants, you have soil, you have water, you have animals, so, and you have gravel. You have so many living and non-living things that all depend on each other for their lives. And all together, those are an ecosystem. So when you make this project, we hope that you'll share with us some results of what you've learned, the whether it was fun, what you've learned, some photographs, anything at all that you're inspired to share with us, and we sure would love to see it. So thank you so much for this piece tonight, 
And now I'm going to turn it over to Elliot, who's going to answer some questions for us and tell us anything else we want to know about the Lachino Islands. Yeah, so if you have any questions right now, feel free to put them in the Q&A section at the bottom or unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your questions away. Um, normally we get a guest speaker, but um, on, on short, a little bit of short notice, I wasn't able to get one. So I'll be your guest speaker. <laughs> I grew up in the Lachino Islands area, like I said before, in Cedarville. Um, I grew up at a really neat uh, camp up there right next to Narnia where my dad was a chef and so I know a lot about the area. I've, I've run different nature programs up there and now I work for Sea Grant. Um, so again if you have any questions or if any of our other um, 4-H folks on here have any questions for me feel free to ask away. Um, <clears throat> Like I said, the, the Lachino Islands area has a lot of different nature preserves. Um, it's, it's rocky shoreline, which is kind of unique compared to the sandy shoreline. There are a few sandy stretches, but a lot of it is rocky shoreline. And it was actually designated by the Nature Conservancy as one of the last great places. They designated a variety of places around the world as the last great places and really strove to try to protect them from development. And part of the reason it was designated the last great place is because it was so undisturbed, so pristine. Humans have done a lot to change ecosystems around the world. And the Lachino Islands area is one of those few areas, especially in the Great Lakes, that is largely undisturbed and unchanged in a lot of ways. So do we have any questions coming in? Elliot, I see a question in the Q&A here. Is Drummond Island part of the Lachino Islands? That is a great question. So the Lachino Islands is, I, I think, somewhat of a colloquial term, but um, it is it does have an official NOAA chart that shows it, um, and it's known pretty well. It's the 36 islands that start around um, uh, Search Bay, so that Search Bay is just a little bit east of Mackinac Island, and it goes over to Rover Island, which is in Prentice Bay, which is not quite all the way to Detour in Drummond Island. So long answer to say no Drummond Island is not part of the Lachino but it is a very similar island it's actually quite a bit larger than most of the Lachinos maybe a little bit larger than Marquette Island uh, it is not part of the Lachino but it is very similar and I, it is another amazing place that I would definitely recommend going to check out as one of the world's largest alvars which is a bedrock habitat where you can literally stand on the bedrock of the earth there's no soil <coughs> or a very small amount uh, and that's because it was scraped away, away by those glaciers I talked about. I think I see another question that says, um, can you talk more about the early explorers? Well, I'm not uh, an expert on the history of people. That's I focus a little more on ecosystems, but I can say I know this. So the Lachian Islands was, um, there's pretty good evidence that there was a number of different um, Native Americans that resided in the Lachino Islands. Um, some may have been transient, meaning they were moving through the area um, as part of maybe an annual migration that they, they took part of or an annual changing of different areas with the seasons. Uh, others may have had longer term residence here, but there was definitely a strong Native American presence um, for thousands of years after the glaciers retreated and the land opened up. Um, but in the uh, 1700s, actually in the 1600s, the late 1600s, um, the French began to enter into the area. This was not part of the original um, British colonies. It was a French area and French fur traders and missionaries were the first folks to come through here, the first European um, folks to come through. The actual, the Native Americans guided a lot of the French fur traders, um, gave them a lot of um, tips on their navigation routes and things like that. Uh, and so the French were the next folks to come through. The English um, eventually established forts like on Mackinac Island, uh, and there were some clashes and change over there. But the next round eventually were the Americans, the newly established uh, US country, and they came through um, in not exactly the greatest way. <laughs> really, the French fur traders probably wiped out quite a bit of the um, beaver that were in the area, reducing the numbers greatly due to the demand for beaver hats, fur hats um, in England. Next came through the um, logging industry alongside the commercial fishing industry, which clear cut a lot of the area. There were a number of sawmills around here. Um, and you know, back then logging wasn't really done super sustainably. So it was kind of clear cut and take everything. Fishing was kind of um, 
a, a thing that happened to some degree, but the, the next thing that kind of happened after the logging as the land started to recover from sort of the, that crisis that happened there um, was tourism, actually. The Lacerno Islands had eight or nine very large hotels on the island. There used to be a ferry that went directly from Mackinac City to the Lacerno Islands before the Mackinac Bridge was built. And so some of the ferries went to the St. Ignace, but some actually came straight here because there were so many people that would vacation in this area. And one of the people who used to vacation here was Aldo Leopold. Um, Aldo Leopold is one of the um, founders of conservation ecology and the land ethic movement. So he's a very famous person in the conservation world and in um, wildlife ecology. And he grew up uh, vacationing here in the summers through his um, kind of probably his early 20s or mid 20s. So uh, quite a cool historical figure here. Uh, so somebody else is asking is that the mailers delivered by boats to homes on the island. Is that true? I don't know if that's true for sure, but I do know that anything you needed to get to your home if you lived on the island or had a vacation home there, and this is true today still for the most part, uh, has to be brought by boat. Um, so I don't know if we have a postal service that goes to the islands, but I would imagine there was some form of mail delivery that took place on the larger hotels that used to be on the islands. Um, today, anything that you you need to get to your island home unless you live on Hill Island or Island of Eight, which do have roads and a bridge connecting them. But all the other 34 islands, most of which have homes on them, um, you need to bring it by boat. So we have barges that bring out people's um, wood if they're constructing a new dock or something. We have barges that bring out folks, um, uh, you know, lawn mowers or anything you need and we have a few uh, grocery stores in town where if you go out to go to the grocery store you boat into town park at the little dock in cedarville and you walk up to the grocery store so any other questions out there well we might not have any more questions today so just want to say thank you for joining us um next week what is our next week's topic Who's covering next week? It is uh, Colonial Michelin and Mackinac in Mackinac City. We're going to explore the fort and learn more about that area. Ah, yes. All right. So next week we'll be exploring about uh, Mackinac City and Michelin and Mackinac. So hopefully you can tune in and join us then. Thank you, everyone. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. And don't forget to make your ecosystem in a bottle. We'd love to see it. Share it with us on our Facebook or email it to me, and we'll uh, give you a little shout out. So thanks again.